What's more fun than listening to us in your car or at work every Wednesday or Friday? Seeing us perform an episode of Sinisterhood for you live. We're currently on tour, and the first leg of shows was a blast. Next up, we're headed to Raleigh, Nashville, and Atlanta, and we have got three awesome topics for those shows. We do. And then we're going to go to Boston, New York, Philly, Chicago, and Milwaukee. Also, great topics. So many topics. And we have a Florida triple play at the end with Miami, Tampa, and Orlando. At all of these stops, we choose a local topic and perform an episode of Sinisterhood for you live. It's like you're right in the studio, except there's laughs and everything's happening in real time. So you get to hear us mess up if we do. (laughs) No edits. No edits. (laughs) We even throw in a fun bonus segment at the end where we hear from you in the audience. And I have my bailiff star in my backpack. And I've got my gavel. Ready to roll. Tickets for all shows are available now. For the details, including dates, times, venues, and more, visit Sinisterhood.com slash live shows. That's Sinisterhood.com slash live shows. See you on the road. Up bump in the night, your heart fills with dread. Probably a murderer who wants you dead. It could be a ghost, a demon, or worse. Perhaps you're the victim of a witch's curse. It's hopeless, you're doomed. You'd call a priest if you could. You'd rather just listen to who? Sinisterhood. I'm gonna kill you. Well, another Friday has come, and we have got six stories to share that run the gamut Mm -hmm. of... Eerie, heartbreaking. We touching. we got a we got an eclectic mix this we week, do. which I always try to curate um, variety. Yes, um, we I will say it. if if there was a graph to depict what topics more people submit, paranormals winning by a mile. By a landslide. Landslide, yeah. I think it's the people that have met Bigfoot are shy. They don't want to tell us that they're friends with Mothman because mm-hmm. then we'll ask to meet him. So that's probably, probably. what's going on. Probably, yes. If I had to guess. But uh, all of them are, as like every other week, they're uh, it, y'all knock it out of the park with storytelling and just vulnerability and openness and sharing. And we appreciate it. Very much so, yes. The, uh, these are, I told Heather, I gasped at one mm-hmm. of them. So... And I had many feelings about all of them. Oh, yeah, for sure. Well, I'm Christy. I'm Heather. And let's get freaky. (laughs) This first one is from Rebecca, and this is Grandma Went With Me to Paris. Not yours, Heather. Calm down. I was very close to my grandma and her living caretaker when I was young. She was a badass, independent mountain woman who had been in a bad car accident in middle age and was confined to a wheelchair by the time I was born. I spent a huge amount of time with her when I was young, learning about the outdoors from her and her caretaker, Fran. Also, a badass, independent mountain woman who loves me with all of her heart and staying up late watching true crime shows and tales from the crypt. It had always been my grandma's dream to travel before her accident and especially to see the Eiffel Tower. She pressed this dream hard into me until she passed away when I was 10. I was devastated for a long time, but always tried to embody her badass, independent spirit. Fast forward to my senior year, and I get an opportunity to spend two weeks traveling Europe after graduation with a student tour group. I busted my ass my whole senior year, working every day after school to pay for the trip. I flew out the day after graduation and started the trip in Rome, working our way north, The group from my school was matched up with two other groups for the trip, so we traveled together on a very overcrowded tour bus. About a week in, we were leaving Switzerland, taking an overnight train to Paris. We got to Paris very early in the morning, so our hotel wasn't ready for check-in. To kill some time, our guide said we were going to drive around the city for a few hours. Somehow, I managed to get an empty seat next to me on the bus that day, so I was trying to catch a nap as I had been paired up with a girl with claustrophobia on the train and got almost no sleep. I came back to the world just as we were pulling up to our first sight of the Eiffel Tower and leaned down to see it out of the other side of the bus. As I leaned over, I felt a presence settle into the seat next to me and lean on my shoulder. I was overwhelmed by the familiar smell and touch of my beloved grandma, leaning over my shoulder, 
looking at the iconic landmark for the first time with me. After a moment, I felt her lips brush my cheek, and then she was gone. I burst into tears of joy, knowing immediately that I somehow had brought my grandma's spirit with me and helped her achieve her dream of seeing the Eiffel Tower. I have felt my grandma's presence a few other times in my life. When I killed my first bear, also a dream of hers, when my son was born, etc., but never as strongly as the first time, when I helped her spirit cross the Atlantic and fulfill her dream. I love it. I knew you Grandma, would love this one. <laughs> Grandma got to go to the Eiffel Tower. Grandma's and going to the Eiffel to say, Tower. When you show Mama pictures of a trip, she'd go, I felt like I was there. Aww. I just felt like I was there. So now I'm hoping her in the afterlife, she gets to go wherever we go. That's awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much, Rebecca, for sharing this with us. It's super sweet. And I never, um, I've never been to Europe I went after graduation to Cancun, so my grandma was not there with me. Or was she? Thank God. (laughs) Or was she? (laughs) Or maybe she was. She was probably, and I was too in Cancun to (laughs) to hear any of the signs, (laughs) to see anything. Oh, what a trip that was! Here, just take another shot. Mm -hmm. shot. Yeah, where's that whistle? The girl with the whistle and the shots. God (laughs) damn! What a what a place. What a time. Yeah, that's, well, uh, did you go on a trip. senior trip? Uh, well, my high school, Miss Mole's class, we got to go on a trip every year. So we went to Washington, D.C. one year, New York City one year, and Disney World one oh, year. And that was awesome. like part of the school. And then when I graduated, I did not go on a trip. I went to New Orleans, and then Hurricane Katrina happened. So mm. I did not have like a post between high school and college or even between college and law school real like trip. Like after yeah. – after law school, I kind of—that's when I went to Europe for two weeks. Oh, that's so nice. That was fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mostly Italy. Yeah. You got four trips in your high school, though. That's yeah. awesome. I got zero. Yeah, we had a good time. Yeah, we had a good time. We had to make <laughs> scrapbooks of the three of the trips. But once you were a senior, you just got to go on the trip for funsies. You didn't have really like an assignment. What class was? Did it? Teach? It was for uh, Renaissance English, so oh. it was kind of like AP GT English, but she. The way she did it, we learned um, like mute classical music, animation. Mm. We learned just sort of that's why she called it Renaissance because it was sort of all facets oh, of cool. like creativity. Uh, but yeah, like the Disney one, we like got to learn animation from Disney and storyboarding a movie and all kinds that's of stuff. Very like that. cool. So, yeah, way to go, Mesquite. Yeah, go Mesquite. I mean, we had to pay our way there, but she made sure we had like fundraisers. So you would do uh-huh. like a garage sale, sell Starburst, kind of like what Rebecca said. You just had to work and mm-hmm. sort of save up, and um, there were some scholarships and stuff. So yeah, it was a cool time. Very nice. And that was I came back and showed Mam all the pictures of Disney World, and she's like, I felt like I was Aww. there. So that's I think that's kind of the legacy of everybody is if you don't get to do something like Ellen and Simon will be like, Mom wanted me to do this, you know, and Mm -hmm. on and on. So we're all of our ancestors' joy. Well, speaking of Ella, this Uh next one. Hard relate. (laughs) Oh, man. This is from Kate, and the subject line is, I accidentally had the FBI investigate my parents. Twice. When I was about three or four, I started daycare for the first time. We lived in D.C., and this was roughly 1992 or so. Apparently, I told my teachers on my first damn day, my mom and dad aren't my first mom and dad. They took me from my real parents. So the authorities were obviously called. But several years prior, the daycare had the same thing happen, and it turned out to be true. The second time I remember, I started at a new school in second grade, and in the first few weeks, I had an art project where we made family portraits. I am an only child, but my portrait included a young, red-headed boy. When asked about this boy, I assume because my last name is very peculiar and I was the only child enrolled at this new school, I told my teachers that I had a younger brother named Ferguson, but my parents keep him locked in the basement. Again, authorities were called, and because of my previous claim, there were already records about my parents. I'll say in the end here that I am most definitely, and to my own chagrin, an only child. I have great parents, but they had a real shithead for a daughter in her early years. Love you, Mom. She listens. Man, three or four. God bless. I feel like this is uh, just a snapshot of what is to come. Uh, she also, Kate also included the Ferguson came from Clarissa Explains It All, which yeah. I loved that show when I was That's younger. A- 
good reference. I remember telling a teacher at like a vacation Bible school when I was real young that my name was Cindy. And so all of my artwork, <laughs> they wrote Cindy on it. And then when my mom picked me up, she's like, who is Cindy? And I was like, that's me. <laughs> You're like, it's my alter ego. I think ego. I gave it up. But I don't, why do kids do anything? Because to see if they can get away with it, to see if they can. Also, it's I on think- that teacher for not remembering my damn name when they asked me. Yeah, they should have. If you have a kid in your class, yeah. I think you would know. No, you should name. know you should. that there's no Cindy on the list. We told Marilyn's little sister, of my friend growing up, you remember those Olin Mills portraits where one, you're facing forward and then you're also yes. facing to the side. Mm-hmm. And it's the same person. Mm-hmm. There was one of her older brother it, in one of those photos and we told her little sister, oh, that uh, the second base was another brother that we had <laughs> named Teddy. <laughs> And then, yeah, Teddy's Teddy's dead. Teddy's and dead. Like, He's Teddy, dead. Teddy never existed. Oh, dead Ted. Poor yeah, thing. Yeah, I feel really bad about that. Sorry, <laughs> little Heather. Her name was also Heather. <laughs> oh, gosh. I, I really need, Kate, for you to tell me what happened when the authorities showed up. I got to know some more details. I need to know what happened the first time. And then again, when they're like, oh, we're back and <laughs> we've got another this call. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, for the daycare, no matter what, no matter how many times it happens, you want to call it call. in just yes. in case, especially after the first one that it was actually the yeah. case. Yes. That's horrifying. No, good for the daycare and good for the school for mm-hmm. taking those things seriously, for sure. Because uh, even if it's 10 out of 10 times, it's not real. At least, you know, you know, you can't, you can't mess around with that stuff. But I feel... I very much feel like Ella drawing some child, <laughs> telling her teachers, oh, that's our, that's my sibling that we're not allowed to talk about. My parents keep him in the backyard. Like, this could easily happen to us, <laughs> for sure. Poor Kate's parents. <laughs> yes, sure. The mom, uh, Kate's mom listened, so I feel for you, Kate's mom. <laughs> you, you know what? I want to hear from Kate's mom. Yeah, I want, right I want Kate's mom to write in her own Freaky Friday, and from your perspective, what happened when the authorities showed up at your house on both of these occasions, please? Your question by the FBI. Yes. Well, this next one is from Lexi, and the subject line is Christmas UFO. Hey, ladies, I love the podcast, and I'm loving the Freaky Friday edition. I have my own UFO story that I want to share. I live in an outskirt of Salt Lake City, Utah. While UFO sightings are not rare to other areas of the state, think Skinwalker Ranch, to my knowledge, they are not a common occurrence in my general area. My house sits on the edge of a 15-acre hayfield, as do the homes of many of my direct family members. My parents, siblings, aunts, and uncles all live on the outer edges of this same field. It was the night of Christmas in 2018, and my husband and I had been at his mom's house celebrating, making our way home around 9 or 10 p.m., As we approached our home, there was a very bright light coming from the sky right in the center of our field, maybe 15 to 20 feet off the ground. My husband could see it too, both of us wondering what it could be. My original thought was that it was a drone that someone in our area had gotten for Christmas. But as we drew closer, the brightness of the light was too much to have been emanating from a drone, nor did it have any flashing lights as drones do. It was a solid, bright white ball of light. Instead of pulling into our driveway, I proceeded to drive around the edge of the field, since other members of our family would surely be able to see this from their homes. I was simultaneously trying to call them on my cell phone to have them take a look. My husband drew his cell phone to try to film the object, but as we turned a corner drawing nearer to the light, it started to zoom out of the field. Up until this point, I thought there had to be a reasonable explanation for this light, but when it started to move at the speed at which it traveled far distances, it was like nothing I had ever seen. Within one second, it was out of the field and down the street, heading north, the direction that we were also going. I increased my speed to try to catch up with the light, but was fully unsuccessful. It was easily a mile away within three to five seconds. As I continued driving, we watched the light fade off into the distance. Within about 15 seconds, we could no longer see it at all. My husband and I were speechless, both of us having no idea what we had just witnessed. No one else in my family saw it. There was nothing abnormal about the field the next day when we checked. No spots in the snow indicating that anything had happened at all. 
Being the sole witnesses, my husband and I often ask each other about ongoing theories to what it could have been. Neither of us have any explanation other than it had to have been a UFO. We're both curious to know what it was doing or what it wanted with the field. I am still hopeful that we will see it again, but nothing like this has happened since. Well, that's my story. Hope it's a good one. Thank you both for the amazing work. I truly enjoy listening to your episodes each week. Well, it's far off from the ranch, but that's one of the things they would see on the ranch was glowing balls of light mm-hmm. that would then zoom off. Yep. We covered Skinwalker in Salt Lake City at our yeah. live show there. I was just thinking about that live show earlier because the Judge Christie at the end of that show still remains one of my favorite that we the have cheese. done. The cheese. cheese fight. Nacho. Yeah. Uh, um, I think these aliens wanted some Christmas cheer. Yeah, they wanted to say hi. They wanted to bring glad tidings. Like Santa, they're riding their little mode of transportation through the sky, possibly dropping off gifts. Maybe the gifts, maybe their present was their presence. That's true. Mm -hmm. And where Santa dropped them off, Santa's an alien too. They're all all part of one thing. Comes full circle, doesn't it? (laughs) That's how he goes so fast. That would be cool to have this giant field and your whole family just lives around it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's kind of convenient. Yeah. It's like close, but not too close. Uh-huh. I had a friend oh, like that nice. growing up in Fort Worth that her whole family lived in this kind of like gated village. And they all had homes there on this property, but the property was so big that they were all spread out. But they had like golf carts so they could just ride to and from each other's homes. It was very cool. That's a dream, man. Mm-hmm. Having a golf cart at your at your disposal. Oh, yeah, for sure. Well, uh, yeah, you wouldn't have caught up with this thing in a golf cart. It sounds like it's going fast, but... I would have chased it. (laughs) Now we have our next email is from Kat W. And the subject line is, a ghost is better than a serial killer. Dear Heather and Christy, my husband and I love your podcast and have listened to almost every episode. When you started your Freaky Friday segment, I knew I needed to write in. I've included a few incidents that made us realize we aren't alone in our house. My husband and I lived on my dad's family's homestead in the country and raised our family. When our youngest finished high school, my husband, our 20-year-old son, and I moved from the country where our nearest neighbors were a quarter mile away to a 1940s house in a town of about 53,000 plus people with houses all around us. Being a true crime buff, in addition to my fascination with the paranormal, I was obsessed with making sure our doors and windows were locked often reminding my husband and son to lock the doors after themselves, saying serial killers like John Wayne Gacy and Richard Chase considered unlocked doors an invitation, and I don't want to invite any serial killers in this house. A few weeks after we moved in, my husband was working nights, and my son was spending the weekend with his girlfriend. I was home alone and fell asleep on the couch while watching TV. I woke up, and the door from the family room, where I was watching TV, to our garage was open about six inches. I thought I'd made sure all the doors were locked due to my slightly irrational fear of serial killers and unlocked doors, but thought maybe I was adapting to living in town and managed to miss locking the door since the door from the garage to the driveway was bolted shut from the inside. I locked the doorknob, put the chain on it, turned off the TV, and went to bed. My husband came home from work in the morning before I woke up. When I got up to greet him, he told me that when he got home, The door to our garage was open, and he was surprised that I would go to bed without checking it. Quote, in case John Wayne Gacy shows up. (laughs) Chills went down my spine as I told him I had made sure the doorknob was locked and the chain was on it when I went to bed and why. We decided that denial was the best policy and pretended nothing strange had happened. Until a few days later, when I was home alone again and fell asleep watching TV. I woke to the noise of what sounded like the chain coming off the garage door lock. I froze in fear as I watched the knob turn and the door start to open all by itself. Somehow, my fear turned to anger and I managed to sit up and shout at the top of my lungs, Stop it! You're freaking me out! Quit opening the damn door! The door promptly stopped moving and has never moved on its own since. We've been in our house three years now and have come to accept most of the activity in our house, except for when my husband had his ass grabbed while he was shaving his face in the bathroom after a shower and was wearing only a towel. Another incident happened last summer when my son couldn't find his car keys before work. He had searched everywhere and had even shaken out all the clothes in his laundry basket and the blankets on his bed. He was getting worried about being late to work, so I told him just to take my car. 
I was handing him my keys when we unmistakably heard the jingle of keys from his bedroom. We both stared at each other for a minute with creeped out expressions on our faces before my son went in his room and found his keys laying in the exact middle of the bed. He grabbed his keys and ran out the front door exclaiming, God damn paranormal bullshit in this house, fucking ghosts. My reaction was more along the lines of, thanks invisible roomie. I guess I can handle the idea of ghosts in my house better than the idea of serial killers. Thanks for reading and keep it creepy. If I see a doorknob turn... I'm out. Yeah. I'm out for good. Maybe the movement of a door can sometimes be suction, you know, like some air or something. But the physical door mm. not moving or the physical chain being mm-mm. lifted, mm-mm. it takes it takes dexterity to lift. I have a chain yes. on my front door. It takes dexterity. You can't. That doesn't just fall off. Same with twisting a doorknob. If yeah. a door just slams open or shut, I can, you know. Make myself think, okay, well, it's probably just wind or whatever. But to see an actual doorknob turn, again, implies the ghost has hands. Yeah, I don't like that. Mm-mm. And can and can interact. And but I fingies, do like because it can take the uh, the thing right off the the latch right off. It's got pinching fingers and butt butt pinching. It was pinched yes. Her this ass. is a frisky ghost. It's very frisky. Gosh, what if she hadn't yelled at it? What would have happened? Oh. That's true. Maybe it would have uh, opened the door the rest of the way. But I do like that it's being helpful and stopped opening the doors and has started helping find keys. Well, and respectful. Because yeah. if it was a malicious ghost, when she yelled for it to stop, that it it would have said, F off, this is my house, and kept doing what it was doing. Mm-hmm. But it sounds like, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know you were home. Let me close the garage door and I'll go back to doing what I was doing. I'll go to back make to up for it, stuff. here are your keys that I also took. <laughs> That's right. It's, a, it's better than a tile tracker. It's a ghost. Mm-hmm. All right. The next one we have is called Crazy Coincidence, and it's from Case Not Casey. Hi, ladies. I'm a huge fan of the show and was really excited when this new segment came out. I debated about writing in because my experience isn't paranormal, but I feel like you might enjoy reading about it. I changed the names of my friend and his dad out of respect for my friend. First, a little background. When I was eight years old, my father was killed in a drunk driving accident. It was a really big deal at the time and was all over the news for a couple years while the case worked its way through the court system. I live in Michigan. My dad died in 1990. The 90s were the Wild West as far as drinking and driving was concerned. The man who killed my dad is a real piece of shit. I don't say this lightly. I like to believe that every person has some kind of redeeming quality about them. This guy does not. Before he killed my dad, he was convicted of drinking and driving eight previous times. He was actually awaiting sentencing on a couple of the charges when the accident happened. He didn't have a license, but he didn't let that stop him from taking his mom's car and heading out to get drunk. During the whole trial process, the prosecutors, supported by Mad, who had been following this man's convictions for over a year and had pleaded for the courts to intervene, charged this asshat with second-degree murder. This caused a lot of ruckus, and they had to have a hearing to see if it was to be allowed. The judge ended up ruling that intoxication does not equal intent, so he ended up getting manslaughter. Now, on to the coincidence. The driver of the other car was so wasted that he didn't realize he was driving on the wrong side of the highway for over two miles. He hit my dad head-on, going 65 miles an hour. My dad's car pretty much exploded, and my dad died on impact. According to the police report, he woke up the next day at the hospital and asked if he really had killed someone. During this time, I was a third grader at an elementary school in Plainwell, Michigan. Shortly after the accident, my mother and stepfather purchased their first home together, and we moved to Allegan, a small town about 30 minutes west of Plainwell. Fast forward to the summer of 1999. I'm 17 years old, and I have my first job working at one of the few restaurants in town doing dishes. This restaurant was owned by my high school boyfriend's family. All of my friends worked there. I hung out there so much, they basically just handed me an ugly green apron and told me to get to work. So this one night, we were slammed. My friend John and I ended up working late to finish up all the dishes. We were comparing notes on how badly our parents suck and were definitely out to ruin our lives. I mentioned something stupid about my mom, I'm sure. Some of the details are a little fuzzy, but this next sentence is seared into my brain forever. Nonchalantly, John said, At least your dad isn't in prison for manslaughter. Holy shit. My stomach just fell out of my butt. I didn't know what to say for what felt like forever. 
Finally, I asked, um, John, what's your dad's name? Jeff, why? Fuck. My heart was beating out of my chest. I didn't know how to put this delicately, so I just blurted out, holy shit, John, your dad killed my dad. It seriously felt like time stood still. I've never experienced such an awkward what-the-fuck moment before or since. Ladies, they do not make Hallmark cards for this particular occasion. So I stood there for a ridiculously long amount of time, staring stupidly at poor John, who was also dumbfounded and staring at me. What are the odds that he and I would become friends? Neither of us had lived in Allegan before the accident, but we both moved there around the same time. We ended up in the same school, had the same friends, and had the same job. These were a lot of coincidences to absorb. Typing all this out, I have to smile because it just seems so crazy. I honestly wouldn't believe it myself if I hadn't been the one to live it. Fun fact, this worthless asshat was released about 20 years ago and has reoffended twice, that I know of. He is truly a waste of flesh. This is the one that I gasped. Yeah. Because when I was reading this, I thought that the guy that killed her dad was going to come into the restaurant. Mm-hmm. So I was, it was a twist that mm-hmm. she was working with the son of him. But what I like is that it sounds like they remained friends and she changed his name mm-hmm. out of respect for who she said is her friend. So she didn't hold something terrible that his dad did against him. Yeah, no, and I think that's... You know, he's suffering to the the kid mm-hmm. is an un- he is another yet another victim, you know, in a different way of having, you know, sure. your dad's now that there's a stigma on that. You don't have a dad growing up. You probably feel some, ex- you know, some extended guilt from that, mm-hmm. from what he did and everything. So that is a very kind heart to remain friends. And that's definitely just a holy shit moment where you're like, you can't what even believe it. What a small world. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the fact that, yeah, you weren't even from there and then you mm-hmm. end up, I mean... That's the universe telling you, you two can learn something from each other, or maybe heal together or, mm-hmm. or something, you know? Yeah. It's um, also eight times before you go to jail, and then you get out, and two more times. Um, I don't even know what to say about that. The reoffense rate for DWI and DUI is pretty high, mm-hmm. and so you see in a lot of states. I think Texas, it's three times, and the third time, it's mandatory ten years because it's the reoffense rate is just pretty significant. Mm-hmm. So she said that they wanted to charge him with second degree murder, but that intoxication doesn't equal intent. Mm-hmm. So, can you ever be charged with anything other than manslaughter in a drunk driving case? Most states now, and Texas is included, you have intoxication manslaughter as its own charge mm. because you that's something that someone would try to relieve because to be convicted of murder, you have to have the actus reus, which is where you, the act of actually taking a life, but also the mens rea, like mm-hmm. the mental state of intending to kill someone or behaving so recklessly. And people would say, well, I didn't know I was behaving recklessly because I was so drunk mm-hmm. that I, so you try to, you would try to mitigate the responsibility. And so m- most states mad is one of the reasons why and like a lot of states like mad would get with federal the federal highway commission and say like don't give highway funds to states that don't pass these kind of laws Mm -hmm. to try to like control the law passage with like the purse strings um and say make it its own offense make intoxications not an excuse make it have these sentencing guidelines and things like that so what if you this is just a, a scenario what if you were at a bar and you overheard someone say, I'm going to get super drunk tonight and then go drive my car and I don't care what happens or I, I'm going to – I hope that I kill someone. Then could you charge them with murder? I think – well, you you know, if somebody is drunk and in a fight, for instance, and gets in their car and then drives directly towards a person like, oh, I'm going to kill that guy I was just in a fight mm-hmm. with, then absolutely, yeah, that's still murder. I mean, you're – acting with the intent to take a life. But if it, and I think if you had uh, evidence that someone said that of like, I think I feel like killing tonight mm-hmm. or like, you know, something like that. I'm then just going to drive around and see what happens. And I don't yes, care if certainly. anybody loses their life. And I think the intoxication manslaughter laws are intended for people who are just driving home drunk and fall asleep mm-hmm. or pass out or whatever, versus that having that intent yeah. where you would have that intent, you would charge accordingly. I think. Well, thank you, Case, for sharing that with us. Definitely. 
This last one is from Sarah V. And the subject line is, my friend was murdered and came to visit. Ten years ago, my friend was brutally murdered by her ex-girlfriend and the ex's new girlfriend. Because of her age and the brutality of it, there have been several documentaries on the case. I have been in three, with her mother's blessing. It's a really awful and painful case, but I think Sinisterhood would cover it well and would love to hear Heather's legal input slash clarification. Brandy was lured out to the middle of the woods, beaten, waterboarded, and buried alive. I, for good reason, could not wrap my mind around the events. I found closure via dreams about Brandy. While it could be a coincidence and my brain looking for healing, I choose to believe they're Brandy making an effort to comfort me. This past weekend, I traveled to Brandy's hometown to do an interview for a big streaming service. In the interview, I referenced a song I remember her singing, but couldn't recall the name. It was a song that stuck with me because the lyrics were pretty. We were driving to an animal shelter to pet cats, and the sun was out. Just a beautiful day and moment that lives in my head when I think about Brandy. Once the recording was done, I was exhausted and made the three-hour trip back home. The next day, I was driving to photograph a client with my photo assistant and had my phone hooked up to the car and was listening to a playlist. I neared the destination, which was an hour away, when the radio switched over from my phone playlist to a radio station. It was on a southern Ohio radio station that we don't get at my house, let alone an hour north. The radio was clearly and vividly playing the song I was referencing in the interview but couldn't remember the name of the day before. At the time of this happening, I was telling my passenger about Brandy and the interview I did, leaving out the part about the song I couldn't remember. I pulled my car into an empty parking lot and said, that's the song. That's the song I couldn't remember. My passenger said, Sarah, you didn't touch the radio. Both of your hands were on the wheel. We stayed parked and listened to the remainder of the song, both crying at how real that moment was for us and me and remembering Brandy. When the song was over, I put my car in drive and the radio went to static, as it should have initially been, being so far from the zone in which it would normally play clearly. Again, it could be a coincidence, but I like to believe Brandy came to visit and give me her blessing on the work we've been doing to share her story. Thanks for sharing these stories and for being BFFs through my phone. You guys truly inspire me. I also really appreciate all the messages you reply to with my thoughts. <laughs> it makes us listeners feel more included. Much love, Sarah. I Googled this case based mm-hmm. on the information that Sarah provided, and it is heinous. Yeah. It's uh, it's real rough. I have not seen a documentary on it, but because of the brutality of the case and the nature of it and that they were they were young. I believe she was 18. I am not surprised that it's gotten a lot of attention and, um, you know, the, to know that your friend, that was how they spent their last moments or your daughter. That was how they, it's uh, not something that you get over. But Sarah, you're doing great, like telling your friend's story and, those interviews, I can't imagine having to relive that so much and rehash it. They truly are exhausting. And I think she was saying, hey, I I know what you're doing and I appreciate it. And I also really want to know what the song was. I do, too. And, you know, like a good friend, if you're like if if you ask me, hey, what was I was you remember that song with the person in the, mm-hmm. and I'm like, oh, was it this one? So it's just your best friend still being your best friend, mm-hmm. even even after she's gone to say, I got you. You couldn't remember it, but mm-hmm. I got you. Yeah. So that's, like you said, that's really difficult to have to rehash it. And um, definitely a brave thing to do if you have the strength to do it, to tell her story and make sure it's it's known and everything. But I think the dreams about her, when I saw a clairvoyant about dreams I had had with my dad, she the clairvoyant had said, you know, if it's within, if they're within, you know, about three feet of you, you know, you can make out their features really clearly. That's like a visitation versus just your brain remembering them in a dream. So it sounds like she may be visiting you as well. And even if it is a coincidence, like you said, the fact that it makes you feel better and is healing, mm-hmm. like I've said before, like regardless of what anybody else believes, if like it helps you. Mm-hmm. And you believe that, then that's all that matters in the long run. 
Exactly. Yeah. Well, thank you, Sarah. And thank you to everyone else that sent in their stories. We sincerely appreciate it. And to everyone else that sent in stories we haven't read yet. We have a ton. So, Mm -hmm. you know, we do six a week. So we, we go through and we try and pick a variety. So if you would like to send in one, if you have an odd but true story, maybe you've encountered Bigfoot, you've seen a UFO, you had a brush with true crime, or you felt the presence of an otherworldly being, send them in at Sinisterhood.com slash Freaky Friday. That would be great. And we also have the Sinisterhood.com slash contact with suggestions for episode topics. Yes. This is something you want us to cover. Another thing you can do at Sinisterhood.com is click on live shows. Yes. And all of our tour dates and ticket links are there. So we've got... We've only done the first leg. We've got a lot of shows left, and we would love to see you there. We're having a ton of fun. We've picked some great topics. We've <laughs> learned a lot. We have. There's. Uh, there, these are when you read, when we pick the topics, we pick them because we like them. And then when we dive in, I'm like, oh, this is going to be like a classic. This is <laughs> like, or this this character or this topic, this mm-hmm. is going to be one that, that people remember. So yes. I, I'm excited to bring it to the road, Yes, y'all. for sure. We love providing Sinisterhood to you at no cost, so if you like what you hear, consider supporting the show by donating to our Patreon. We're a small operation, creating the show for you by researching, writing, recording, and producing it ourselves. Any amount is sincerely appreciated and helps offset the cost of making and hosting the show. As a thank you, you'll also get some sweet perks like ad-free episodes, a Sinisterhood sticker, membership to our exclusive Patreon Facebook group for those enrolling the airwaves and getting into it tier, a special shout-out on the show, a monthly bonus mini-sode, this month's is an update on the Rodney Reed case, and patron-exclusive video and audio content, including Am I the Asshole, Relationship Advice, Judge Christie, Dear Sinister, True Crime Headlines, and more. You also have the fun perk of access to our Discord server, where you can connect with other fans in real time and discuss the latest in true crime, share personal ghost stories, or just post adorable pictures of your pets. We hop on occasionally, and we host monthly Q&As on Crowdcast, where you can ask us all your burning questions. And for patrons not in the U.S., you have the option to pay in pounds or euros, saving you the cost of the conversion fee. Annual memberships for all tiers are also now available, and those that select this option will be rewarded with a free month of membership. For more details on all of this and specific member tiers, visit Sinisterhood.com and click Patreon on the top banner. So many of you have been tagging us in pictures of you sporting your sweet Sinisterhood merch. Keep those pictures coming. And if you want some cool Sinisterhood swag like t-shirts, mugs, totes, and even clothes for your kiddos, visit Sinisterhood.com and click shop on the top banner. The best thing you can do to help us grow is like, review, and follow on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcast. And please tell a friend who you think would like us to check us out. You can also just click those three little dots at the top of any episode and share it with them. If you think they'd like something that you heard today, just go ahead and share it. It means so much to us and really helps podcasts like us get more exposure. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Sinisterhood Pod and like us on Facebook and at Sinisterhood as well as TikTok and YouTube. Christy, where are you at? I am on Twitter and TikTok at Christy or GTFO and I am on Instagram at Christy M. Wallace. Heather? I'm on Twitter at MCK versus the world and on TikTok and Instagram at Heather versus the world. As always, the devil rules the airwaves. Keep it creepy. Sinister.